Good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm happy to be here presenting this monthly MPA webinar, part of our webinar series hosted by the MPA Center, Open Channels, and EBM Tools Network. And today, our topic is an incredibly important one where we talk about marine protected areas and alternative livelihood opportunities. So specifically, we're going to be talking about livelihood opportunities for coastal communities in the Eastern Caribbean. And uh, we have three speakers who I'll introduce in just a moment, but uh, just briefly, the, the subject of today's webinar is uh, the Eastern Caribbean and the work that's going on there by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States to provide small livelihood grants to applicants uh, on a variety of, of issue areas to provide opportunities for income for people who are living in coastal communities near marine protected areas. So um, I will I will introduce our speakers here in just a moment, but I just wanted to remind you all that uh, this is a great opportunity for you to ask your questions and make your comments. So there is a, um, a question bar on the webinar interface. Please feel free to go ahead and type in your questions as you have them. We have three speakers today, and after they are all done, we will go ahead and have a Q&A. We'll also make sure to post both the slides and a recording of the webinar afterwards uh, so that you can go back. If, if you want to refresh your memory or if anyone you know uh, missed the webinar and wants to tune in, that will be available. So our first speaker today is Mrs. Joan John Norville, who has been active in environmental management uh, for over 30 years. And she is currently the program officer in the Social and Sustainable Development Division of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And she coordinates the OECS Sustainable Livelihoods Caribbean I'm sorry, Sustainable li Livelihoods component of the Eastern Caribbean Marine Managed Area Network. And she enjoys assisting communities and coastal resource users to improve their livelihoods while conserving the natural resources of the area. And then our next speaker will be Michael Savarin, who is the president of the Tantan Village Development Corporation in Dominica and the project manager for the Cam Pam Ekman project, which works to strengthen the management of the marine section at the Cabritz National Park through capacity development and livelihood opportunities. And then our third speaker will be Mr. Roland Baldeo, who is the MPA National Coordinator for the country of Grenada and works under the Grenada Fisheries Division within the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. And he oversees the success of Grenada's three current MPAs, as well as the proposal for the island's newest MPA in Grand Anse Bay. So first, I will turn it over to Ms. John Norville. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, everybody, for attending and participating. I am Joan, and I work with the OECS, as was said before, which is a 10-member group. And in case there is anybody not from the Caribbean, we are 10-member group, in, six of which are independent, and are part of the Ekman project, which we will be talking about today. But first, let's look at sustainable livelihoods. Next, when we speak about livelihoods, we're talking about the basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing. And for a livelihood to be sustainable, it must be able to cope with the stresses, as well as to enhance its capabilities and assets, or at least maintain them, not only now, but in the future. At the same time, it must not undermine the natural resource base. So we must have the balance between conservation and use for survival, both of humans as well as our other biological resources. Next. Yeah. The OACS recognizing the need for this sustainable livelihoods for member states, especially when we look at now we are establishing protected areas in, although I prefer the term marine managed areas in relation to the, what should I say, to the marine conservation, the OECS has been working with both land and marine protected areas but recognizing that poverty and for protection to be successful, you have to strengthen the 
livelihood opportunities, either through enhancing these or providing alternative um, sources. So in other words, for long-term management of our island's biodiversity, it depends on the benefits that the local communities that, de that utilize these resources, they feel they can derive and their engagement in such management initiatives. And as such, local livelihoods and poverty reduction must be considered during the establishment and management of MMAs. So we have had three approaches. One looking at seed fund or small grants to provide the tools and equipment for either startup of new enterprises or enhancing existing ones. That is on condition that there are no negative impacts on the marine resources. Then we also look at capacity building as well as training and sensitization in support of small business development related to natural resource management. And of course, small grants can only stretch so far. So we need to look at collaborative partnerships and complementary initiatives, both at the regional, national, and uh, community level to see how we can work together to make better use of the scarce resources. Now, these approaches have been successfully demonstrated in the Ekman project. Next. The Ekman project, otherwise the full name, the Climate Resilient Eastern Caribbean Marine Managed Areas Network project aims to establish a network of effective marine managed areas that provide for improved livelihood opportunities. Now there are four components, but two of them are related directly to livelihoods. One is the establishment of new and strengthened existing marine managed areas, which may or may not um, disenfranchise some of our livelihood persons. And the second one is to build constituencies for sustainable livelihoods and ocean use, which includes marine area management and using a co-management approach. So looking at conservation, and livelihoods. The OECS member states, well, there are six and independent ones participating in this project, and they are listed here. And the beneficiaries would include fishers, displaced fishers that have new enterprises that they're willing to get into and get out of fishing, micro enterprise owners, community stakeholders, and of course, the marine resources. Next. So we've put that together to show the relationship between the objectives of the Ekman project in terms of the strong constituencies and the fact that you can have livelihood demonstrations targeting these communities as well as the utilizing sustainable fishing practices and livelihood opportunities and as such contribute to the strengthening of the MMAs. Next. Okay, some of our, these are a list of some of the alternative livelihood, well, some of the livelihood support projects. Um, what I would like to say, I mean, we will be going through them later on. In, well, when I say there are two of them that we will be going into more detail. So we just flip through the list from Grenada, St. Lucia, Dominica, next. And Nevis, St. Kitts. There are over 20 livelihood support fund projects that is part of our support program. And um, all the six member states, some of them have at least one, of which some are joint proposals. So we have these micro projects. Can continue. And some have started. Next. Have started. And we have recognized some lessons learned, some challenges. And just to go through quickly, 
the for us the processes and capacity of the project beneficiaries was a major challenge because the small groups find many of the processes for accessing and utilizing the funds frustrating at times so we recognized that we needed for sustainability we needed to bring the groups into the business mindset and we needed expert advice preferably at low cost since we wanted much of the project funds to go towards the beneficiaries so we looked at collaborative partnerships and one of these has been the livelihoods working group which is a committee of regional experts volunteers in the areas of business development marine and coastal resources management socio-economic monitoring they were established under the Ekman project and have been providing assistance to the livelihood support fund. We've also looked at a mentoring program to improve the capacity of beneficiaries because when we looked at some of the concepts, we recognized if we wanted sound business proposals, we needed to give them persons to work with them, not only to develop the business plans, but for the first six months to work with them to implement and the next six months to monitor and step in where necessary. Of course, we provided the resources, which was the funding, and we also, for sustainability, kept going through a rigorous process to review and enhance the proposals to ensure that they had a better chance of support. And also with the mentoring program, we feel that the project beneficiaries would be better on their way. So the focus of the Livelihood Support Fund was the demonstration of income generating activities that can provide sustainable livelihoods to fishers and coastal communities while protecting, restoring, or improving ecosystems around target areas. Next. And some of our successes and opportunities the fact that we were able to build partnerships not only at the regional level through the Livelihoods Working Group, but also at the national level where the support entities were able to come together to provide assistance to the project beneficiaries. We also have in-country project coordinators that also help to provide direct assistance as well as the mentors. And at the community level, we were able to get certain communities, um, certain project beneficiaries together. For example, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, although four or five proposals were submitted focusing, all focusing on lion fish management, we were able to get them to come together and submit a joint proposal. The same for St. Lucia, we were able to get there were four or five proposals submitted relating to tours and enhancing businesses in the Point Sab protection, environmental protection area. We were able to get these to come together and they have been working to develop a comprehensive package that could be sold to tourists as well as residents alike. And all of them can be in the independent or interdependent on each other. That's it. Thank you. I will now pass you on to, I'm not sure if back to the, our moderator or next, our next. Um, you can just introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we are going to look at two of our projects. Well, in two member states, and one of them is in Dominica, and it deals with the Tantan Village Development Corporation. And Michael Saverin, who is one of our lead counterparts with this particular project, he will introduce and give you a little more detail about his or these projects in Dominica, including his, um, the one that he is responsible for. Michael? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much um, for, for um, the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here and to uh, engage in the webinar. Next page, please. Yes, um, uh, Tatan Village Development Corporation. I'm the president of, of that entity. It's a non-for-profit 
uh, uh, organization that uh, uh, belongs to the village of Tatan, which is in the northwestern uh, part of Dominica. Uh, the village really sits right in the middle of the Cabrit National Park uh, marine section. And um, we, um, uh, the villagers, uh, uh, have formed a, a corporation in part to develop livelihoods uh, out of the resources, both marine and, and land. Um, we um, are engaged in the Ekman project uh, um, as the, the, the Ekman project manager, and it's, that project uh, has uh, nine community stakeholders, and the idea is to develop a management authority and system for the Cambridge National Park marine section. There's a land component and there's a marine component. Uh, the stakeholders are other villages like the Tukuri village, which is in, in the further to the north of us in Tatan. It also includes the uh, Portsmouth Association of Yacht Securities, the individuals who provide security and other services of yachts that visit primarily in the Prince Rupert Bay. It includes the Portsmouth Fisher Folk Cooperative, and the Portsmouth Fisher Folk Cooperative includes fishermen from Portsmouth all the way to the village of Capuchin in the north. And uh, our uh, institutional partners like the Ministry of um, Agriculture and, and Forestry, uh, and the Fisheries Division, the uh, Dominica Association, uh, Dominica um, um, Port Authority, the uh, Portsmouth Town Council, and the uh, Cottage Council. So the local municipalities and local community-based entities have come together uh, to, 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 to implement uh, a community-based management model uh, for the um, Cabrit uh, National Park Marine Section. Um, an integral part of this management model is both conservation and preservation, uh, as well as the development of uh, sustainable projects, projects that utilize the uh, environment in a sustainable way that reduces extraction from both um, land and, and sea and, 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 and also undertakes considerable publicity about the importance of the, uh, of the reserve. The, um, the uh, next slide please. The, uh, the, the work uh, being done in, in with the um, uh, development of the management authority for the, the Cabrits National Park Marine Section uh, complements the work uh, of the OECS um, LSF project uh, in that it complements that by providing additional livelihood support uh, to partners that are already engaged in the uh, um, management in the Ekman project, which is the management of the uh, Cambridge National Park Reserve. Uh, so it, it reinforces the work that has been done by providing additional livelihood support to allow the stakeholder partners to develop uh, economic uh, uh, projects that provide some uh, economic sustenance for uh, 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 partners and members and helping to reduce uh, um, uh, extraction from the reserve as well as, well as promoting uh, the environmental aspects of, of the reserve that result in, in fact, its, um, its well-being. Where we are with our particular project in Tatan, we're looking at developing water sports services. Uh, and um, the LSD, um, the OECS has provided support with regards to getting a, uh, a boat that will allow us to provide a number of water sports services, including um, uh, uh, scuba diving, as well as a glass bottom viewing. Um, where we are at this point is we've engaged a contractor in Grenada, uh, and who, who that contractor has a, um, a designer uh, um, a company in Canada. We have been we have placed them in contact with the authorities of our maritime unit, given that the the boat much missed the specifications of the maritime unit. Um, there have been several um, uh, um, discussions and different models and presentations, schemes of what the boats will look like. Uh, I think the Maritime Division, uh, as of yesterday, we were informed by the, the, the construction company in Grenada that um, there was a conversation um, recently with the Maritime folks in Dominica and that um, 
uh, the subsequent um, discussions and a, a finalization on an actual uh, design that, and once we get that design, um, then we can move forward. Next slide, please. Yes, the, the, what is anticipated is that the, 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 uh, the developing water sports services uh, uh, will have a direct impact uh, for, for, for members of the village. The, the boat we're looking at conceptually is about maybe uh, almost 43 feet long, um, perhaps carrying about 40 uh, passengers. And that is um, a significant, uh, a, 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 good, a good boat that will allow us to employ uh, a number of, of people who we have, some we have already trained in terms of water sport services, uh, the various certifications that we require us to deliver that service, as well as, well as other, other services. Um, we can then uh, complement the water sports services with some of the land-based services that we have. So for example, we have an, an, an eco-trail uh, where visitors can walk the trail uh, and view the fauna and the flora and a, a beautiful gorge we have in the village of Tata. Um, last, um, uh, in, in May, we engaged an American company that used the trail extensively to film the, um, the next series of the American Tarzans, which we'll be showing in um, on the, the um, National Geographic on July 9th. Um, uh, of course, we got some revenue from them from that activity, and we'll be using again the the um, publicity as well as the slides from that 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 series to to um, advertise uh, our eco trail and, and to marry our eco trail with the sustainable activity in terms of the water sports. Um, um, so uh, this is, um, these kinds of activities are, are main of our focus. Uh, we think there's considerable opportunity uh, in these kinds of activities given that uh, we can get uh, even, even perhaps more revenue from them than direct uh, um, agriculture in, 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 for instance. We think this is in, in our community is perhaps the best and uh, the best way to deliver um, considerable economic uh, jobs and opportunities for us. Uh, and the, what, what is wonderful here is that these activities then reinforce the conservation efforts both on the land and on the sea. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we'd now like to turn it over to our next speaker, Mr. Roland Baldeo, who is uh, from Grenada and is going to be talking about uh, the activities there. Thank you. Okay, thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, could I could we go to the slides, Lucien? I'm not seeing it coming up. Uh, the first slide is up for us. Oh, thank you. So. Today I'm going to talk about uh, livelihood uh, initiatives in our MPAs. And let me first say that when we established MPAs, when we start managing MPAs just over five years ago, we have, you know, I mean, it was pointed out by many persons that look for us to succeed with the establishment of MPAs and, you know, managing MPAs, uh, we must have community buy-in, we must have community support. And it was critical that we, we provide livelihood opportunities for the fishermen especially that we displace. So we have taken the decision in Grenada um, as part of the livelihood support fund that we were receiving through the OECS and the Ekman project that we would focus those resources specifically uh, to uh, in MPA where we have MPAs in the adjacent communities and to features who we displace. So that was a, a very conscious decision that we made. Look, we, we have long been asking for um, uh, you know support for livelihood and um, a lot of funding that has been coming through over the years. A lot of it has been going to studies and you know. Um, and we, we said, look, we want to have more of those funds on the ground. So we have decided that the little resources that we're getting for the livelihood will focus on the areas. So next slide. 
We have in the Molinier MPA, we had uh, some of the features who were displaced. They start, you know, have small boats and so to take visitors out into the MPA. And we said, look, we would go uh, give uh, three of the fishermen uh, two new boats and two engines because um, these were guys that were uh, fishing in the MPA before and these are the guys we, we should be helping. Next slide. So this, this uh, picture here is one of two of the guys in a small boat that they have been using before. I'm not sure if the next slide is up, but the next slide should show um, uh, one of the, the keys here. Uh, the, uh, this guy was a key uh, spearfisher in the MPA before we started management. And when we established management and we um, had active uh, rangers and so, of course, we displaced them and we said, look, these are the guys that we really want to help. And, you know, in helping them, we, we knew that we would get the support of the community, you know, the, the wider, all the adjacent communities, when they see that, look, we are putting out ourselves to help those guys who we displaced. Uh, so we have, um, uh, through the fund, uh, buy two new boats. Next slide. We have built two new boats, uh, five of glass boats. I would feed them with the uh, outboard engine and provide uh, uh, accessories and so life jackets and radios and and those sort of things so that they can they can um, start taking visitors out to the MPA. So these are the two boats um, that you're seeing in the in the picture now that we provided to the three fishermen: one boat to one fisherman and another boat to two of the fishermen. So and th these were guys who were, who were living right. Uh, in the area. Next slide. So the next three slides um, basically shows the boat, you know, from different angles and so. And um, it was something that we were proud of. And um, even in the community where we uh, provided those, in, I mean, that this initiative, you know, we we got very positive feedback. And you know, people were saying, yeah, these are the things that we we should be doing. So um, I'm not sure the other slides are up yet because I am having a, a poor internet service here, right? So yeah, these boats were built locally, and we, you know, we had a nice uh, image on the boat with the logos and so. Next slide, um, you see. Them. And then you you should right. So let's go on to the the other slide. So the other slide you should be seeing is where the actual visitors, um, these are the guys with the visitors on board. And as I, as I, I tell you, it was, critical, it was very important for us, you know, in providing that assistance because the Molinier Bushujo MPA was an MPA that we established in 2010. And, you know, even the prime minister of the country, he lives in that area. And from the onset, he said, look, we need to provide for the fishermen that we are displacing. And, you know, he was very strong on that. And, you know, he said, look, we need to do, uh, look for help to, to assist those fishers um, that we displace or else, you know, we would fail with this MPA. And, and that is why we decided that, look, you know, we, we would focus our, our help on, uh, on those guys. So. I mean, they were really the, the, the fishermen. They were really happy to have the boats, and um, today, with the boats were handed over in November 2015, and the, the the boats are working very well, and they are taking visitors. And even what used to be happening before is that the Molinier MPA is on the west coast of Grenada, and all the visitors and all the the persons who come to that MPA to scuba dive and the snorkel came from dive operators more from the south of the island and we never we didn't have anybody from the area you know benefiting in in a way to you know where they would take they were, had the opportunity to take visitors out so now that the community they are seeing look we have these two boats there you have visitors leaving the hotel now drive up to the the the, the community and the village of Molinier and you know going out with these boats i think this this is, was very important for us in terms of building support. 
So we were we are really happy to the um, with the outcome. Next slide, please. We were really happy with the outcome of you know this project, and we we hope you know we, we really hope that we could have been doing a lot more in the areas. Now the next slide shows an American visitor when we were setting up the area for the handing over ceremony of the boats. And the morning we were there, and the lady, this lady in the picture, she was on a yacht close by. And she came and she saw setting up the tent and the chairs and, you know, the boats were there and so. And, you know, she said, look, she, she's really pleased with what she's seen. And what, what she said here now um, in the quote, she said, I do think this is amazing because this is conservation in the right way, involved community and providing an economic opportunity. And I mean, she was very sincere and she, you know, she said, look, I, I feel so impressed. I want to give a donation towards this initiative. And she, she gave a, a cash financial uh, contribution. That same time she said, look, you know, she, she really liked what she is seeing. And, and that is what is so important, you know, in our livelihood program, okay? Uh, what we are doing in the morning MPA. Next slide, please. Well, I do think this is amazing because this is conservation in the right way, involving the community and providing an economic opportunity that uh, keeps the park going so people don't need to fish there. They have another alternative. Okay, so the clip actually played here. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide, yes. So uh, we, are set, we have set up a, a Molinier Bushiju MPA Livelihood Association. And this association has, of course, the, the three uh, fishermen who um, receive the recipients of the boat and eight persons from the adjacent communities. And these eight persons would be operators in a craft center. Um, that's a second part of the grant that we should be accessing very shortly. And we have planned to build a craft center right in the area also where in the adjacent community so that persons from the community now would start doing craft and so to sell to visitors who come to the MPA. Now, in that MPA, in the Molinier MPA, we have the first underwater sculpture park. And it was very, you know, I mean, it, it received worldwide attention, you know, all over, BBC, CNN, etc. So now we have uh, thousands of persons come in to visit that sculpture park. And so we are saying that those, you know, we will train those craft operated uh, persons to build miniature sculptures um, so that they can sell. Many, you know, many visitors wanted to have a sample of the sculptures. They enjoy looking at the sculptures, but, you know, the, the most they can take is a, is a PTA. But to have miniature sculptures that you can buy and you know put in their homes and so they always ask about it. So now um, we would involve persons from the community in making those miniature sculptures. You know, doing T-shirts. Um, next slide. You know, uh, you know the lionfish. We have a lot of lionfish in the area now. So um, the, we have initiative elsewhere that has been very successful in with lionfish jewelry. So we plan to um, have that. Now this is a the floor plan for the craft center that would be constructed. Um, so the, we, we'll have um, five persons in the in the actual craft center itself, okay, who will be operating there on a daily basis. And as we said, all this is you know when the community, we are, you, you know, would would understand that look, the MPA authority is putting out themselves to help persons from the community to benefit from the MPA. It would build more support. We want to have ownership of, of this and not the seeing this as just something that the dive operators and the, the other operators who live elsewhere in the south of the island benefiting from. We want them to, 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 um, to, to get the benefit of, of it. So as I'm saying that the, 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 the lionfish uh, pro, um, program, the next slide would just show you the lionfish, which everybody know, and the, 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 the the slide before the last will just show some of the um, next slide, uh, Lucien. I'm not sure if it's up yet, but um, yeah, okay. And we can go to the other slide. 
right? So these are some of the lionfish jewelry that uh, have been made elsewhere and so on. We, we want to train those uh, craft vendors as part of the project to make those jewelry and other things that they will be doing and selling to the visitors who come to the MPA. You know, we have thousands and thousands of visitors visiting the MPA and the community, as I said, have not been benefiting in any way. So by doing those craft and so they can, you know, we, we would work together with them to get the support and, and we hope that by providing those opportunities, we can continue to build support. And as, as I close, um, we are establishing marine protected areas elsewhere. We have, you know, Grenada made a pledge to protect 25% of, of our near shore coastal areas by the year 2020. But we cannot achieve that goal in any you know, way if we don't have community buy-in and support from the fishermen and communities where we have those MPs. So it's critical, you know, I've been saying this at many levels, that we have too much of the studies and too much research, you know, and not enough funds coming to on the, for on the ground activities. And that's what, you know, we hope the international community and donor organizations would realize because too many times a lot of projects coming through and it's for another study and for another report again and you know we have enough of that so let's get more money on the ground let's get more money in for our livelihood uh, opportunities for the persons we're displacing and if we can if, if we have that kind of success we, we can establish more areas and we won't have any resistance from the communities and things so my last slide which shows um the uh, just you know an image of that we made uh, we use that image in our programs and so on. so I want to thank you very much for your attention and I'm, I'll be available for any questions or so after thank you very much thank you very much to Joan Michael and Roland those were great presentations and those lionfish the lionfish jewelry is really beautiful never seen anything like it before uh, so I'm going to encourage everybody to go ahead and type in your questions in the webinar interface. If you have any questions, I see that a couple have come in, and I will get to those in just a moment. But before I do, I, I guess I'd like to ask the three speakers, do you have any comments on what you think has been the biggest barrier or um, difficulty you've encountered so far in trying to get these livelihood projects up and going? Well, I mean, yes. If I take it first, um, yeah. Okay, let me take it first. Well, one of the problems we have, as I said, we have now uh, two MPAs under active management, and the funds that have been provided for livelihood, um, for livelihood in the MPAs and so, is very small. And because of the, you know, the the, the area and what we can do, we have uh, a lot of persons asking, you know, for other opportunities, but we have no resources. So the amount of resources pose a challenge for us, we could only help a few people, and that has been a challenge again, and it comes back to the point, of, uh, as I've been saying, we need to have more funds, and I remember this particular project that we were doing, there was a significant amount of budget for just monitoring, okay, of the livelihood uh, initiative, and I said, no, I mean, let's put more of the funds into the actual provision that we were giving out, and we were able to get some more monies added on, but as a said you know let us uh, that was a challenge that we faced in terms of the amount of funds that we had to to um to give uh, the, those grants and so on okay thanks any other comments on on barriers okay um this is june as I had said before some of the issues for us was the capacity at the community level and that is the reason why we had to get you know, the partnerships, the mentoring, because it's very hard to tell, you know, like a small group, like, for example, the Fisher, like Roland, in Roland's case, the Fishers, they would not have been able to prepare the proposal. They know what they wanted. They knew their dream. But we had to give them assistance in putting together that proposal and also in implementing. So the mentoring for us is very important. And the fact that you can get persons specialized in other areas, business development and so, to volunteer, to help. For us, that was a success story, that level of partnership. The other issue, again, from our side, let's say from the OECS, 
I am not a business development person, but going through the proposals, we recognize that if you want to put in this mindset of business micro enterprise, you need to foster it at communities and put it, let them see themselves as business owners because sometimes we only see ourselves as being able to attract funding and a dependency on external funding, but not seeing ourselves as being able to take what we are given as seed fund and bringing it to the next level, level and see, eventually being our own business owners where we can either attract our own funding or get our own loans. So this sort of mentoring for us was very important. Okay, thanks. Uh, there are a couple of questions about the source of funding for this project. Maybe you could just explain a little bit who the donors were uh, that supported this project and, and the business mentors, whether that was something that was a volunteer or, uh, or those people were also paid as part of the project. Okay, yeah, I actually was coming at the end just to remind that the Ekman project is coordinated by the Nature Conservancy and the funding support is from the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Building and Nuclear Safety. So the OECS is spearheading the livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods component, but we also have other project partners such as CAMPAM, SPORAC, the Caribbean National Fisher Folk Network, the Net Caribbean Network of Fisher Folk Organizations, PCI Media Impact, all the national entities, whether it's fisheries or environment, depending on who is involved. And um, we, it's a, a whole layer of partnerships, and we've been able to get together. The Livelihoods Working Group, which is the business development specialist, and uh, the natural resource management persons, project management, SOPMAN, include Sumis, Canary, Campam, a few people, including individuals, private individuals, and they are all volunteers. They do not get paid for sitting, reviewing the proposals, giving their feedback, helping to monitor. They are all, it's all a volunteer group. And I must say, when we had applied, we got quite a few people and we actually had to select and they've been more or less constant and working very, very hard. So my hat's off to them. That is definitely a success story in terms of partnerships for us. And at the community level, those some of these same persons also either worked with the community groups or provided some support, or some of them, even within their organizations, they were able to get initiatives that they could use to strengthen and build some capacity for these project beneficiaries. So we also had these sort of complementary initiatives coming out of this initiative. Some of the business development specialists in country, they are getting a stipend, but what they are getting is not is, in, is enough to help in terms of their travel costs. And so it would not be the same amount as if we actually had to hire a consultant. And considering the length of time that they are working with the, the groups, they would be working with them for at least 12 months. We would, what they're getting is literally a stipend. Okay, thanks. And have you all identified um, metrics of success, how you're going to evaluate the success of these projects? If, okay, I can continue. Yeah. We have a monitoring, um, how would I say? We have a monitoring strategy, but most of our impacts of success is built on the implementation of the business plans and the success of the business plans. Apart from the outputs, whether the outputs in the proposals, for example, the procurement of the boats, the launching of the tours, apart from these, the Things like the income generator, generation, the growth of the business, these are some of our indicators of success. The partnerships in terms of the interrelationships between the various organizations at the community level, 
the awareness, uh, Roland mentioned, for example, that the community are seeing more buy-in because one of their own or some of their own are actually involved in getting generating or getting revenue from this livelihood as against people from outside coming in. And they also are seeing other initiatives that they can enter as complementary initiatives, other businesses. And that is the, the formation, for example, of the Livelihoods Association would also help to um, help to manage the MPA because we are also including awareness of the the need to conserve mar marine resources and to pass on that information to others as part of the the whole project implementation process. I'm not sure if um, Roland or Michael may be able to say from their part of the management of the MPA how their business as well, how it helps. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, for us, uh, there are a number of of of, of um, objectives. Um, we keeping, as I mentioned earlier, we are a community-based management model, and I think that um, with that model, uh, it entails um, a lot of um, uh, outreach, a lot of. Um, uh, engagement and efforts at, at, at keeping the various diverse um, stakeholders um, engaged and, and, and committed and that in fact is a is a challenge in in delivery uh, we have partners that are, that are that are very much committed um, um, but when you have um, when you have to to engage a community um, project in the extent that I that I described it, it it an extra time and effort has to be undertaken in ensuring participation um, um, to, uh, um, and groups and communities airing their perspectives and so on and that that's administratively it, it strengthens the project but it, it, it it's um, it's a challenge um, in terms of our outcomes we at the end will be another formally although the Kirby's marine section national park marine section the national park but the MPA will, will be formally designated at the end of the process. We have a cabinet paper, we submit to a cabinet, and that's a legal process uh, uh, at the back end um, will come through. So that for us is a major um, objective, the formalization through the, the cabinet and the relevant legislation towards the end. So that, that is a, a very key um, outcome. Um, in terms of the, the overall Perspective. I think one of the things is 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 looking at the MPA not as a combination of things, not in, as a distinct um, 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 uh, entity of itself, but an economic development um, philosophical kind of um, approach that is holistic, and that is why um, we are trying to link uh, link all the important elements in it. And I think that is a a, a um, uh, uh, an approach I think that will um, cement the success of it but it also means um, having to do a lot of work in, in, in getting that broad sort of um, um, a picture. Uh, also I mean, each individual um, stakeholder, we have nine stakeholders, all stakeholders have to uh, uh, have success in terms of economic well-being, uh, improvements in the opportunities, uh, and, and so, so it is important that every stakeholder uh, undertakes development investments. These investments are successful. These investments are reviewed. Uh, with the capacity uh, uh, development support required by each stakeholder uh, to ensure that that success um, uh, 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 is there at the end. And of course, we see ourselves as links. So I think that the individual communities, what the Ekman project has done, in fact, is 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 although we've we've, we've interacted together. It has cemented and is cementing even more the bonds between ourselves and our other local NGOs, uh, and as we can begin to do a number of things together, um, like marketing together, maybe maybe even doing products together. You know, so so it's 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 um uh, these are important outcomes um, uh, uh, that 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 we're looking at uh, uh, through the through the project beyond just the effectively managing and 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 and, and conserving uh, the 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 the, uh, the protected area but also what it does for communities in terms of building communities capacities improving livelihoods increasing interaction between communities 
and, and increase and, and developing a very strong uh, um, community-based advocacy for environmental protection, conservation, and preservation. Thanks. So one of the things you all talked about was this idea of teaching people how to be entrepreneurs or business people who may not have this experience. And so we, there are a couple of questions about the business side of this program, uh, including the size of these grants and whether uh, recipients are required to pay them back and how they are selected. Can you talk a little bit about, about those elements? Okay, um, the selection process was rigorous. As, as we said, we saw the concept notes and we tried as much to make the proposals as sound business as possible. The grants, the size of the grants originally, well, if we look at it in terms of euros, the it ranged from about 10,000 euros, we said, to could be as much as 50,000, but what happened is that many of the the applicants, because of the amount and the countries felt that they wanted to give more than one person uh, or one group a chance, we sort of kept it to about 30 to 50, well, we'll say about 15,000 to 20,000 euros per grant. and. Overall, for the country, it was about 200, about 75,000 euros per country. So, in some cases where, and that is where we said, for example, we saw the synergies in St. Vincent with the lionfish management, the synergies between the applicants, and in St. Lucia with the tours, we got them to come together. So, training and these things were done as a group, and that reduced, that reduced, or well, that increased the amount of um, their resources since they were able to pull it together and submit joint proposals. So we got more out of it than if they had done it as individual projects. Um, so in that case, the size of the grant may be the full 75,000, but there were four or five beneficiary groups working together to to benefit from that particular, the Ekman Livelihood Support Fund. Um, some, there was another question. I think those were the main ones, so thank you. The, the other question that has come up was about um, the food supply and, and what happened when people stopped fishing in the MPAs. Uh, was there a need to get food from other sources, and how did that work out? Was that also an impact on the community? I'm not sure if I quite understand that question or not. Could you? Yeah, let me Could try again. Doing? It was a question about when the establishment of the marine protected areas, if they prohibited fishing, did that have an effect on the food availability to the local communities and uh, in terms of not being able to fish there. Were they fishing for subsistence or was it mostly a market fishery? Well, subsistence fishing mainly, but um, yeah, I wouldn't say that the community were deprived of uh, access to food. Uh, the, the guys that were displaced, obviously, it affected their income on end because these were uh, small-scale subsistence artisanal fishermen. So they had to, you know, they had to try to go elsewhere to try to make a living. So these were the guys, but not so much the community itself and the availability of food. Okay. And were there other alternative livelihoods that were not tourism related that this project has uh, explored or supported? Or were they mainly focused on tourism? I mean, you're talking about Grenada, or uh, maybe June would take up that one? Yes. We had others, for example, in Antigua and Barbuda. We had one looking at climate smart agriculture and also enhancement of agriculture. So we worked with um, one of the agencies was looking at aquaculture and aquaponics, where you combine um, aquaculture with growing of plants, so you have your fish and your plants, 
and another one was with the schools where the schools went into livestock production well mostly poultry then expanded their poultry enterprise into layer so they we gave them enough funds for them to um, some chicks as well as broiler and they were also able to put in a processing facility so it also was this one was very good as well because you had students who were involved in agriculture and who actually wanted to set up their own businesses so it wasn't only as a CXC in terms of a, getting a certificate but also for them it was a an enterprise, a potential enterprise, and they actually run the business part of it in terms of that livestock production or the poultry production in the Princess Margaret School in Antigua. So they they saw other sources apart from fishing, though some of them come from fishing families, so they were able to see alternate sources of um, livelihoods. Thanks, and I, I want to note that there are a lot of comments just really congratulating the three of you on this very innovative and, and important and valuable project. So I think people are very interested in this and particularly in the mentorship component of it and, uh, and as you just mentioned, the school part of it in, in sort of teaching people a new culture of business focus. And so as a closing question, I just wanted to ask you all, you just mentioned, Joan, the, the component of climate change. Can you or any of the other speakers touch on how climate change is being addressed through this project? Um, I can mention some in the sense of we also in our criteria for project selection and implementation, because remember it's a climate resilient project, so we try to encourage, for example, that um, we put in climate um, I don't like to say climate smart, but climate adaptation in a sense, practices. So from the, for example, some of the structures that are being put in or renovated, we want to ensure that there's water, rainwater harvesting, for example, or storage facilities for some of the things that take place out in the, the water. We want to ensure that they, you do not have, um, how would I say? things that would affect or um, cause further or further exacerbate the impacts of climate change. So we try to put it in and it depends on the different projects but for all of them we also had a one of our criteria what will the climate change adaptation or climate resilient measures that will be included or would be included in the project implementation. Okay, and then if I can just get you to quickly, the three of you, each say as, as we close, what you've been most encouraged by based on your experience so far with this project. Let the others go first. <laughs> Any quick impressions? Well, okay, if I take it, I mean, my, what I was encouraged by from this project is the, the support that we received from the, the communities um, after we uh, delivered these boats to those guys. You know, I mean, it was a different um, attitude towards us as the authority. I, I think now that they, they were seeing that we are genuinely doing something, in, you know, to help the guys who were or this place. So, I think the, the kind of support we receive after was encouraging and that, that stands out for me. Great, thank you. Any other comments on that? Okay. Yes, um, okay. yes certainly uh, the, the, the little, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, certainly the, um, uh, the, the response uh, from the community has been good. I think that um, the Cabris National Park uh, is well known uh, uh, in Dominica and in the local community, so this was uh, an important uh, thing to build upon, and uh, certainly uh, it has been well received um, by the community. I think that the um, the increasing partnerships, as I mentioned before, between ourselves and other other NGOs engaged in the project, I think that is um, uh, pleasant, and uh, really is a, a, a good uh, um, sign as to um, um, indication as to um, 
what we can do as we continue in that in that effort. Uh, the support we've also gotten from from the from the authorities uh, uh, has also been good. Uh, the, the the ministers uh, and the the various players of government have also um, shown support. That has been that is also very good. So so clearly um, we've, we've, we've 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 gotten support uh, from the community and and others to have to truly really give us additional impetus uh, as we we move forward. And that that has been good. I think the the um, that's been very good indeed and, and, and very welcome. All right, for John. Me, any final words? Yeah, well, for me, it has been the partnerships that have come out of this and the networking. So, I mean, as I said, between the private sector, whether it's dive companies, whether it's business development, fisher organizations, the fact that people actually they came together, they saw the synergies, especially private sector that has been very supportive. To me, that has shown that communities are alive and well once you can get persons go in and they have a, a joint, how would I say, goal to achieve. As well for us the, at the regional level, at the national level, I've found a lot of partnership, a lot of support. And to me, these project initiatives demonstrate that you can get successful enterprises that can generate income for persons, coastal resource users and their families if we utilize these resources wisely and that we can reduce the pressure on our marine resources to at the same time get additional livelihood opportunities. And for, for me, working, as I said, I love working with the community and that is the foundation of their survival of that and that of future generations. So this balance between MPA or marine managed area use and livelihoods, that sort of partnership, I think, can be demonstrated and replicated elsewhere. And for us, we just hoping that we continue to build on these successes. And just to say that I want to thank the NOAA team for facilitating this webinar and Lucien across of TNC and TNC and whole, on the whole for also facilitating um, our project partners, including Roland and Michael for the great interventions and uh, the uh, participants, those who have tuned in for their questions and for listening. And I really enjoyed this webinar and hope that we can do more as well as participate in more of these. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to thank our three speakers again, Joan, Michael, and Roland. Thank you so much. And also our uh, our webinar co-sponsors, EBM Tools and Open Channels. And just to remind you, if you came in late, that the webinar recording will be posted on Open Channels. So thanks. And uh, again, thanks to our speakers. Really great work. Bye, everyone. Bye. OK, thank you very much. Bye-bye.